Hey guys, Raul here with another episode of Cold Emails Hot Takes and today we have I think the first return visitor, Levi Erola. We had a podcast I checked eight months ago when you were in Bali. I checked now your Twitter has quadrupled, you have even more stuff there. I think you've completely pivoted but do you mind giving people just a really quick over what happened between those eight years, when, eight months where we last spoke to you in the style of uh, Quentin Tarantino, please? So during those past eight months, I was living in Bali. Life was looking great. Uh, traveled a bit more. Ended up uh, spending a lot of time in Dubai, just ramming business there. Uh, we started scaling uh, our consultation company called agentsofvelocity.io and realized suddenly that fuck, my calendar is full, extremely full. Uh, so we have pivoted most of our energy towards that business. We still have a few done for you clients, but we have all, we have almost 200 clients in Asia Velocity, so can't really do that much other things right now. So that's pretty much my life right now. Sounds good, man. So you, like we pivoted from an agency to instantly, you pivoted from, from your agency to a course helping other people create these leads and agencies. And I think the first question that I want to ask, the most important one, what is turbo ramming and why is it so effective? Turbo ramming. I don't know if this is PG rated podcast, but turbo ramming is basically when you take something and you just school of fuck the universe with the amount of volume you're in injecting to the universe. So if you're sending cold emails, you're just scraping every single possible lead that you can get in your lead list and you're just slamming campaigns every single day to different lead lists and you're pretty much doing so much stuff that it's impossible for you to not find traction and find a winning campaign that you can leverage and make a lot of money with that's beautiful but you're like a poet man and is that what you see most people struggling with when they start an agency they start cold emailing 100 percent. most people are um i wouldn't say too comfortable but most people just don't understand what is actual hard work uh sometimes we might get someone who becomes such a customer. They're like, yo, I'm ready to go. Like put in some hard work and I'm okay, let's go. But then when they start, it's they're moving really slow. So I have to jump in. I'm like, okay, bro, this is not hard work. This is actually hard work. And then we need to like show them that, okay, you need to be launching campaigns every single day. You need to be cold calling, LinkedIn, doing everything you possibly can. Because if it's your business, of course, you want to make it successful as fast as possible and if you have clients who want to get them fast results as fast as possible so the easiest way to get it faster done and get traction fast is just do more and most people don't really they think that there is a you have to do this amount of campaigns and you have to do this and this and this just do much do just as much as you can it's really hard to lose if you do that i agree but on the other hand i feel for most people, if it's starting out, like they need this threshold, they need this structure, they need certain limits and goals. So if we talk about turbo rhyming, just getting yourself out there, what would you say is like, if I'm starting out, I'm starting out my agency, I want to get a client. What's the fastest way to do it? How many email accounts? How many campaigns? What would you do? Uh, our SOP for it is 10 domains, two email accounts on each. So you have 20 email accounts, you warm them up. You get 3,000 leads on a broad audience. So instead of going extreme specific, go broad. Because that way you can actually find demand in the market and you can see where the actual problems are. So take a list of 3,000, uh, create six different campaigns or six different campaign variations. Make them as different as possible, targeting different pain points, different benefits, different end results. And basically this way you're just testing like the right direction to go in. And then you just shoot 500 leads for each each variation, two follow-ups for each. And as you're doing that, and as you're managing the inboxes, go to LinkedIn, find your prospects, send them personalized video messages. And also if you are able, cold call on the side. And if you do that for two to three weeks, you will get your first client. It seems like a no brainer, but I'm pretty sure if you have 200 people right now in HD Velocity, what do you think you probably have like some people that fail, right? What do you think? Why is the reason? Do they just not put in the work? Yeah, people are too comfortable or they overthink. Um, some people just start working with us and they, let's say they have a busy nine to five job, like they'll have a, like a high level career. That's a lot of our customers are people who have a high level career. Um, so maybe they are a high level software developer or a account executive in a tech firm and they are getting paid good money for that. So it's really easy to, prioritize on that and 100% understand it, but they don't have the urgency 
that they need to have to kickstart fast. So they are moving really slow. So they don't end up pretty much failing, but they end up going nowhere. Yeah, like I've noticed that a lot with my friends and for some people, like you just can't help them. They pay the money, they join the course, but they don't take any action. Like it's not going to work on its own. Exactly, exactly. And I checked your video from Agency Velocity's website. So you have the three main steps there. And the first one was get a case study. So what are the main ways that you recommend people that are just starting out get that case study? So pretty much going through the SOP that I choose to, choose to went through. So just looking to find the traction. Like some months, months ago, like a year ago, when Alex Ramosi came, came up with his book, probably a lot of people have read it. And it talks about riches are in the niches. And that has been a common theme in the really internet marketing space and online business space. Go extremely niche specific. But we noticed the flaw with that is when you go really niche specific, uh, you end up just pretty much hoping that it's going to work and hoping that you go, like the niche, the specific niche that you pick works if you have no previous experience from it. So that's why we always recommend going really broad. So let's say that you work with, you go in the marketing and advertising industry and you close one client that is a marketing technology company. So they're a marketing SaaS company and you close one client that is a paid ad agency. And then you close one client that is a PR company pretty much can fit into marketing and advertising as well. So you have three clients pretty easy to get done in like one to two months to get those clients. And then as you work with each one of these, you are able to find like, okay, let's say that the PR agency is the easiest one to get really good results for and the other two are a bit average. So what you do is you go all in for the PR agency and you pre pretty much do everything that you can to get the case study from them. And then you have the case study, you start reaching out to similar PR agencies. So you pretty much automatically niche down because you are finding the actual traction in the market. Makes sense. And because you have so many students, you're helping so many people, is there some niches that you see consistently work and consistently fail? Uh, all traditional, boring, service-based businesses are really good. That's that's what we see. Um, everyone wants to be in SaaS. Everyone wants to be in all these cool startup niches and uh, get paid from a big v VC fund. But actually, we have seen that for most beginners, the most money is made when you go and take really boring industries, let's say accounting, just for example, and you go to a specific uh, part of the world where maybe the marketing and sales information that they have is not as up to date as let's say in US. And you take the best practices from the US market and you use them in another market uh, for that boring service-based business and you scale through that. Because usually they, have, they might have been there for 30 years. They're really old school or their competition are old school. Everyone uses the same practices. So if you're able to be the first one to leverage something new in that market, you're usually able to make a killing. Got it. And so once we have the niche, we have the going after the case study. The second part is identify bottlenecks in your market. So what do you do that? How does that work? Yeah, so <clears throat> what we have seen is a really traditional thing that a lot of people do, and I have done this as I've done this to myself. Is you let's say you get your first client and you get it, they pay you two thousand bucks a month. Then of course the automatic thing for you is okay. I want to scale this ten k, so I just need four more clients. So I have five clients paying me two k a month, and pretty much you scale horizontally. So you just get more two k clients, and you really try to productize your service. Yeah, 100%. There's really a lot of advantages with that. It's maybe a bit easier to delegate and a bit easier to build a team for that. But it's also the margins are going to be way lower and you're going to have way more headaches. And in my opinion, if you go into a business and you start an agency business, you start a done for you service based business. In my opinion, the, like you shouldn't even your goal shouldn't be to build a huge organization for the next 10 years and have a big theme there. Uh, in my opinion, the really the service-based model is just learn skills, get the first case studies, get competency, get cash flow, so you can use that cash flow and those skills into other uh, ventures. But pretty much what we have been noticing is, okay, scaling vertically makes way more sense. So let's say you get three clients and you want to make 15k a month, then your goal should be just figure out, okay, how I can provide extra value to these companies and how can I make them more money so they can pay me 5,000 a month instead of 2,000 a month. So how we do this is pretty much identifying 
revenue focused bottlenecks and solving problems because basically providing value is just solving problems and the most valuable problems to solve are the ones that are bottleneck in revenue growth so things like okay do they have a low closing rate can we help with there okay do they have a low show up rate can we build an automation that helps with that okay is their landing page converting bad on traffic that they're getting okay can we build them a new vsl can we build them a new landing page can we do different things outside of just providing cold email and this way you are able to just work with a few high quality clients you don't need a big team you can have really you don't need a big team uh, you can just have a few really good clients maybe a one or two vas working with you and you're able to pretty much scale by making the clients worth more instead of just getting more clients yeah. i love that the expansion revenue side same for size it's so much easier to expand on your current customer base than going after a new one so really smart stuff uh, and the third point was you optimize uh, your time allocation with AI and automation. Can you give some examples and the biggest ones that will help people save the most amount of time? 100%. So the first thing that I just want to mention here is usually when people get to 15, 20, 25,000 bucks a month, um, like you can pretty much get to like 10, 15,000 dollars a month by just being a dumbass. You can go out in the market and if you just do enough of stuff, you'll probably hit 10K a month pretty fast. It's not really that hard and you don't need to be smart at all. And uh, you don't even need to be smart to go beyond that, but that's like, you can just fuck around and hit 10K a month. But usually when you go 15, 20, 25K a month, the problem is, is not being able to find clients or deliver a good service. It's actually time usage and you don't know how to spend your time most profitable way. So you end up spending your time really poorly. And because time is the most scarce resource in the world, that's going to really affect your revenue because you as a business founder, you are pretty much the biggest leverage in the business, at least for the first few years. So, <clears throat> so pretty much how you would optimize your time allocation is you just do a time audit, for example, uh, a really good good thing to do for everyone. So you just, for a week, you track exactly what you're doing, what tasks are you doing, minute by minute, task by task, and you get a really, really good overview after the week. Okay, this is what I did. And you just track, okay, this directly correlates to a lot of revenue generated. This doesn't have any ROI with it. This has a low ROI. And then your goal pretty much is just to take as much time away from the no and low ROI task things and just put that time into the high ROI task things. So let's say that you have lead scraping and you spend five hours a week on scraping leads. Okay, can I just hire a full-time lead scraper for 500 bucks a month or 750 bucks a month? And can I teach them all of these things and can they do this for me? Yes, they can. Okay, boom, you hire this person and now you're able to take the five hours and you're able to put it into something that is way more higher leverage, doing sales calls, doing new campaigns, doing copywriting, doing like whatever it might be, uh, solving other problems for clients. And this way you pretty much like you spin through this cycle that, okay, you just figure out what are your lowest ROI tasks. Maybe it's accounting tasks. Can you automate it? Boom, you can. Can you outsource lead, lead scraping? You can. Can you do X, Y, and Z things? And then if you just keep doing that for six to, nine, six to 12 months and you do it right, you end up in a situation where you are just doing all, everything you do during the day is just high ROI and everything else is pretty much taken care of for you. Got it. Makes sense. And yeah, we fucked this up a lot in our agency. We started outsourcing too late. We just like wanted to do everything by ourselves. It's like such a huge relief, not only time, but just like stress, just get rid of like all of that. So hundred percent recommended. And I have an interesting question about, so if you look at the, all the different steps that go into cold emailing from the technical part, niche, finding leads, copywriting, a lot of effort. A lot of people are asking us in instantly templates in the copywriting part. But I was thinking like, if you think about uh, dating, online dating, like dating apps, or just like reaching out to people or like NBA players. Like if an NBA player le- reaches out to a girl, it doesn't matter what he says, like it's going to work, right? So the the brand that you build around yourself, how important do you think that is for new agencies starting out their website, their LinkedIn, their Twitter profile? How much uh, impact do you think that has? Yeah, I would say that something that I also realized a bit too late, in my opinion, I wasn't really able to, or like I was doing it, but I didn't know that I was doing it uh, like a year ago or a year ago. So pretty much if you have a good digital presence, it doesn't even need to be a big audience, but if someone Googles your name on your company name, you better have some good shit pop up from Google search. Because pretty much there's so much noise and so many different offers out there in the market and people are getting cold emails. So it really matters if 
what your social presence is looking like. If someone gets a really interesting email from you, they get an offer, you're like, yo, John, I can make you extra money. And they're like, okay, this sounds dope, but I have gotten a few of these emails this week anyway. So I just quickly check what this guy is doing. They Google your name, they Google your agency name. And if there's like nothing showing up or your landing page is extremely poor, or you don't have a LinkedIn profile or whatever it might be, it immediately sets up these extra red flags. And it doesn't make you can't sign clients that way, but it's just going to add friction to the process and you just have to do more work than necessary. In my opinion, like a good VSL and a good LinkedIn profile. And let's say you have some YouTube videos. That is just a multiplier, multiplier on the actual energy that you're putting into the machine. Like if you're sending, let's say you spend an hour on building a new cold email campaign and you're expecting to get XYZ results from it. If you have a good digital presence, it's going to multiply those results that you're getting. So pretty much the time that you're spending here on actually building the campaign, the results are going to get multiplied and you're just pretty much, again, spending your time more efficiently and more profitably when there's something that they can actually find when they Google your name and Google your agent's name. Yeah, love that. In the beginning, same stuff, man. I was I was not doing it at all, but now I understand how impactful it is. And we're just getting organic visits and organic uh, reach outs and like calendar bookings thanks to good online presence. And the last part from your uh, VSL that I saw, I really liked your sales approach because I feel so many people are struggling. They don't have the background. They haven't done sales. It's very unnatural for them. But what you said was using logic-based arguments. So it's not this like flashy, no sales tactics. Can you elaborate a little bit? How do you make, how do you tie logic into your sales pitch? 100%. So that's actually really something that has been really helpful for me as well. Uh, I have seen both sides of the coin. I used to sell door-to-door electricity contracts and I used to sell in shopping malls for like four years. And that was really like flashy sales tactics, extremely aggressive, like every single trick that you can learn in Wolf of Wall Street movie. Like we were using every single one of them and it was fun and it was fine and we were doing good. But what I realized that, okay, for a lot of people, they haven't gotten that experience in life. So it's really hard for them to jump in and start like doing a really shark-like sales approach. So it just makes more sense to just use common logic. And of course, a lot of people are really emotional buyers, but then when you have the logic uh, on your sales process down, then it's very easier to add a bit of that emotional uh, fairy dust on your sales process to make them make them convert. And pretty much what we have been doing is just presenting a really risk free ROI. So let's say you run you run a lead generation agency and you are providing cold email as a service. You're not even doing anything else at this point. You're just providing cold email as a service, and you talk with a company, they are a marketing agency and one client on average is worth $20,000 for them with their lifetime value. So you jump on a demo call with them, you have already qualified them, you have already talked about a lot of things about the problems that they have. So then when you go into a pitch, you pretty much just explain them, okay, John, usually when we work, to get, work together with a company, you're aiming to work with them for a 12 month time period because uh, outbound and doing cold email it's not a one night thing you just don't build a campaign and skyrocket your revenue it actually takes iteration and of course because we are working on a performance basis we of course want to also work with you for a longer time so we are actually like in- incentivized to make it work really well for you so john let's say that during these 12 months on average we book 10 calls a month for you that would mean that we book you 120 calls during these 12 months but let's say just to be completely realistic that only 80% or 80 of these calls end up happening and end up showing up. So we book you 120 calls, but only 80 are qualified and they show up to the meeting. So during the 12 months, you have 80 calls. Again, like extremely easy, extremely simplistic. You don't throw any keywords out there. Really simple things that you're mentioning here. Okay, John, what is your closing rate on outbound right now? If you have 10 outbound meetings, how many of those are you closing? And then they tell you, yeah, we close 30% of the calls we take. Okay, that's dope. But just let's, again, be a bit more realistic. Let's say that you only close 20%. So we get you 80 calls during 12 months, you close 20%. That would mean that you get 16 new clients during the next 12 months as we work together. So if you're one, if one client is worth $20,000 for you, that would mean that as we work together for 12 months, you are generating an extra two, $320,000 from this partnership. And then they're like, okay, that's, that's dope. That's dope. And they're like, yeah, I, I get that. But then how you make it even stronger is you show them first, then you show your pricing. So 
basically what we charged with this, like you probably think that this is going to cost you a hundred thousand dollars to get started with it, but it's actually extremely cheap. It's just 5,000 bucks upfront. So we get everything built and you pay that once. And then during the 12 months, you only pay us $300 for an extra, for every single call that we book and every single call that actually shows up and ends up being qualified. And now they're like, okay, yeah, this makes sense. And then how you really nail it home is you just show them, okay, John, all of this looks great, but we both know that it's way easier to make these calculations here on this whiteboard or on this slide deck or whatever, and they will always look good. So let's make it a bit more realistic. Let's say that instead of you closing 20%, let's say your best sales rep gets sick and he, he can't sell for the whole 12 months. So you have to hire your hire your um, software developer to sell. And they have never sold, sold a thing in their life and they couldn't sell water to Africa. So let's do this and let's have him as the sales guy. And he's going to start closing at 10% for you. So your closing rate goes from 30, like you said, to actually 10. And let's actually make it even way worse situation. Let's say instead of you closing at 20% uh, or let's say that instead of your clients being worth 20K, let's say that they're only worth 20K, 10K. You lose your best growth marketer and you can't sell your upsells anymore. So you're closing at 10% and one client is worth 20K. Still from here, if we just calculate it, 80 calls, 10% closing rate, 10K lifetime value, you're still making 80K during this 12 months. So there's like, you are just showing them a worst case possible every single time you're going, making it worse and worse and worse. And then if your pricing is right, and if you have a qualified client on the call, it, the end result that they're always going to generate should always be more than your actual price for the whole partnership. So it just, it is like you show them, okay, this is the like average case scenario, like a really realistic end result is that you make 220K and you pay us 40K. But let's say that everything goes fucking wrong and you only make 100K, you still make more money. Or let's say that you only have a 5% closing rate, you still make more money. Or let's say that we only get you 40 calls, you still make more money than you're paying us. And you just show them multiple bad end results, but still show the client that, okay, you're going to, in any case, what happens, you're always going to make more money. And then when you add a few guarantees on top of that and good case that isn't social proof, it's like impossible not to close. Man, I love this. And like anybody still listening, watching this, that's all it takes. Like you just have to do this, like write down the numbers, make it logical, just an ROI argument. I think this is the key. People can make so much more money if they just start doing this. So amazing stuff. And final question that I want to ask. So when we did the first podcast, you were in Bali, you've been traveling, Dubai, some other places. So there are these people like David Goggins is just like full monk mode, working all the time. But there are these other people like you, just like traveling and still getting shit done. So how do you balance that? And how do you see the traveling helping you in your journey of making money? 100%. So I think there's really two sides of the coin. You can also go, you can always go like really David Gawkins or full Alex Becker, empty apartment, just monk mode, nightmare mode, whatever it might be. And you can just run like that. But what I've seen and what I've felt my like, myself is when I do that I have done that in the past and when I do that I just get extremely sucked into the business and my judgment and my thinking everything just gets like super fuzzy and I just like can't think of anything else and I really like overwork myself not like overwork myself but it's like the actual work that I put in isn't as powerful as it is uh, and when I just go through different places, uh, it for sure helps with world wor perspective. It gives you a good story. You just learn and see so much. Something that I have been seeing is something that I have been missing now lately is I used to, for example, I, I was staying in Bali for like two months. Then I went to Bangkok. I was there for three and a half months. And then I went to Dubai and I was there a bit over four months, I think. Now I came, came to Paris and Nice and I, we are just staying here for a few weeks. So that, okay, every single time when I stayed in a place longer, I actually started enjoying it a bit more because I got like really used to it. So probably um, during the summer, I'm going to go to a few places, visit a few places, uh, Norway, Finland, and uh, just check out a few quick, quick trips. But then I'll probably like, again, try to do like a six month stay in one place and see how that affects me because I feel that. Uh, it is just a lot of testing. It's like everything in, in life. I haven't done that much traveling, at least this way. So I'm trying to find like what is the best balance for me work-wise and also just enjoying the actual place where I'm in. Yeah, love that. And I was talking with my tattoo artist and she said like she doesn't take bookings more than two months in advance because she doesn't know what she wants to do. So it's this balancing of being in one place. So you get a rhythm, get used to the place, but also like let's say you just 
you can't take it anymore. You can just let go. You're not locked down full time. I really love this, but uh, I really feel it's not for everybody. But yeah, I agree. I think like that's also the beautiful thing uh, when you are living in Airbnbs. I have for the past 10 months, I have just been living through Airbnb. And I think it's extremely beautiful. Of course, in some cases, it's a bit more expensive. Uh, if you look at the rent prices, for example, in Dubai in Airbnb and or compare it to rent in long term, you're for sure paying a premium. But what I love about it is through Airbnb, if you have all your places through Airbnb, you're able to stay for a longer time. For example, in Dubai, we were just extending month after month after month the apartment and we did the same in Bangkok until we felt that, okay, like we don't want to do it anymore. But then you're also able to like just and stay three weeks in Nice and move on to the next one. So I have really like the freedom that you just have an app on your phone and you can decide where you live and you can decide how long you live there. And it sounds extremely simple and it's like, yeah, like, of course, that's, that's how it works. Then you actually have the have the app that, like, you can use to decide where you live and decide in which kind of apartment you live in. Uh, it truly gives you a different kind of freedom. Even if you stay in one place, you always know that you're, like, five clicks on your phone away from living in, like, wherever you want in the world. Yeah, and do you feel like this... So, obviously, it's motivating for you, like, for me, to see for the people that join Agency Velocity, a lot of people have the same vision, like... They're doing the cold emailing, but it's just like to get to travel, to see the world, to actually see that it's like big things. Do you see a lot of people, like more and more people getting into a travel lifestyle? hundred percent. I think, uh, for example, in Asia Velocity, we have had a few, few really go- cool cases. We had one dude, uh, Oliver uh, Fallen Green, an absolute chad. He came in, he turbo ran for like two, three months, get to really good numbers, got a really few good clients, and then he just moved. I can't remember the exact place he rented. First time I think he flew to Thailand and then he went to New Zealand or something. And he sent us like, on, we basically have a private channel with every single one of our clients. We have like our whole team, our consultants, me, and then them in a private Slack channel. So we are able to help them one-on-one every single day. And he was just sending pictures like from the back of a van from like a mountain in New Zealand where he was creating cold email campaigns. He's like, yeah, life is good. I've just been living in this van and I'm just grinding here. In my opinion, it's just the fucking craziest thing. It was so nice to see. Um, so yeah, I think more people are getting into it and they're like seeing it happen. But also I feel that a lot of people come in and they start working with us. And this probably happens with a lot of other businesses as well. But they're like, yeah, I just want to make 5K a month and I just want to go travel. And then they get in and they see get to the 5K a month in the first month or first two months. And they're like, fuck this. I'll just go hard. I want to get to 50K a month. So a lot of people end up getting really sucked into the business grind as well when they actually like get results with it for the first time. Yeah, man. Love that. So yeah, this is for everybody else to figure out on their own, like what they want to do, but legit cold email. It's like so weird. Like the boring, most old, most like simple, just like text, just sending characters <laughs> via internet. It fucking helps us like travel the world, live in amazing places, meet people, make tons of money. <laughs> I don't get it, bro. Like this is like outside the matrix. It is, yeah, it is dumb. It is, I think, like, learning how to do cold emails makes everything, like, super... It just makes everything super dumb. Uh, a good example of this is my dad. He's, uh, run, he, he, like, runs uh, the financial side of one uh, football team in Finland, a football team that I used to play in, where my brother plays in right now. And they are going for the F- F- Finland championship, and they are, like, trying to get sponsor, sponsors to fund their next season. Uh, so they can get like players from the USA to play with them, etc. So they're just trying to get money raised. And when I talk with my dad, and he's like, "Yeah, I don't know how to like get this, get these uh, sponsors." Keep in mind, he has been in sales for 20 years, an absolute Chad, head of sales in a big company, an absolute sales killer. But he, like, he doesn't have time to book calls with cold email and just cold call people because yeah. <laughs> uh, he's like working a real job on the side as well. So. I told him like, yeah, let's, let's, let's run a cold email campaign. Like the worst, dumbest, worst, dumbest idea. Uh, like get, let's get sponsors for this football club with cold email. And we start the cold email campaign. We prepare it for like a month. Uh, we scraped an extremely random set of leads to one VA that we use. And it was just like, a, I was every single time when I was creating, I was like, yeah, if this works, this is the craziest shit ever. And we launched the campaign his inbox floods with positive replies. He just books call after call after call. The booking <laughs> rate was like 3% on the campaign. He closed like, on the first week, he closed like four deals from it. 
uh, like 100% closing rate, four phone calls booked, four deals closed. Uh, it was just the dumbest shit ever. And I was like, okay, yeah, cold email. Like, yeah, it doesn't make sense. <laughs> Love that, bro. <laughs> That's a good way, I think, to end it. You can just call email for everything you want. Thanks so much for being on here, bro. Awesome to talk. We're going to have Levy on in our Facebook group. It's going to walk you through a little bit more in depth about cold email, about agency velocity. But meanwhile, uh, Again, thanks so much. Where can people find you? And if they're interested in agency velocity, where should they go? Yeah, 100%. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting me here. It's always a pleasure. But you can pretty much find me from Twitter and YouTube. That's the most active platform for I'm in. Just use my name, Levi Erla, and you'll find it. Um, if you want to build a 10K a month lead transition agency and help us scale it to 10K a month personally, 90 days, check out agentvelocity.io. Book a call. I'll see you there. And yeah, pretty much just check out our stuff and boom. Uh, maybe Perfect. I'm going to leave the links below. Subscribe to the channel, like, share, and see ya.